she allegedly died by the hand of the man who was supposed to love and protect her. Police say the Camden County man beat his 11-month-old baby daughter for hours. And tonight, not only have we learned that there were warning signs, but that the father never should have been alone with her in the first place. Todd Quinones is live from the Kennedy Memorial Hospital, where efforts to save the girl's life are failed. Track, a cellar train has derailed. The high speed train jumped the tracks in New Haven, Connecticut. The train was heading south from Boston to Washington. Of course, the cellar stops right here at 30th Street Station in Philadelphia. 60 passengers and 12 crew were on board the train. We do not have information just yet as to whether any of the passengers were from the Philadelphia area. And so far, there are no reports of any injuries. This just happened. One confirmed report says the train is laying on its side. We're working on getting a live picture from the scene, and we'll bring you any more information, of course, as soon as it becomes available. After a seemingly endless and sometimes ugly campaign, we are on the eve of the Day of Destiny. It is in our hands now. This race is so close that President Bush and John Kerry spent the day before trying to get every last vote in a frenetic tour of battleground America. We are live on Capitol Hill tonight in a night filled with ceremony, pageantry, and remembrance. The state funeral for our 40th president, Ronald Reagan. 200,000 people came here to Washington to bid farewell. Several thousand from the Delaware Valley. Some lined the streets during the procession. Others are in the Capitol behind me right now. All are quiet witnesses to history. Let's take a live look inside the Capitol building. Americans from all walks of life continue to pay their respects, filing past the flag draped casket. It's a somber yet dramatic scene in the Capitol Rotunda. I think history is going to remember Ronald Reagan as the man who said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, and eventually the wall came down. But many Americans are going to remember him for the way he made us feel proud and optimistic. And when there was tragedy, he comforted us. When the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up in midair in front of the nation with school teacher Krista McAuliffe on board, President Reagan gave an address to the nation from the Oval Office just a few hours later, and somehow, after that awful tragedy, he made us all feel proud to be Americans. So, to paraphrase that perfect speech, we wave goodbye to Ronald Reagan as he slips the surly buttons of earth to touch the face of God. I'm Larry Venti. We continue now with our commercial-free coverage of the attack on America. We want to begin by recapping the incredible events that will change our lives, will change the world forever. This national tragedy began at 8.45 this morning. A hijacked jetliner slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. The crash set the immense building on fire. Thousands of workers were already inside. They had to run for their lives. The hijacked plane was American Airlines Flight 11, carrying 92 people from Boston to Los Angeles. It was an incredible sight. One of our nation's great buildings burning out of control. And this was just the beginning. Eighteen minutes later, cameras were rolling as the tragedy mushroomed. A second hijacked jetliner plowed into the South Tower at 9.03 a.m. Watching this, you have to be thinking, it can't be real. But it is. Flames were shooting out of the 110-story building in all directions. The plane involved was United Flight 175, en route from Boston to Los Angeles. Sixty-five people were on board. The pilot was from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. The collision sparked a massive fire that killed countless people in the building and on the ground. We are learning today of some incredible acts of heroism in the face of certain death aboard United Airlines Flight 93. That's the plane that crashed in rural Pennsylvania. Forty-five people perished on this plane. The plane was headed from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco, but hijackers apparently turned it around and were trying to crash it into a building in Washington, D.C., possibly the White House. Dina Burnett's husband, Tom, was on the plane. She says he called to tell her it was hijacked, and he said, quote, a group of us are going to do something. A group of us are going to do something. There are reports that passenger Jeremy Glick called his wife and said he and a few others came up with a plan to stop the terrorists. The belief is that there was a struggle and that some heroic passengers, possibly those two, managed to bring the plane down in a deserted part of the state, avoiding a populated 
government site. True Heroes. Well, tonight, U.S. warplanes like the B-1, the B-52, and the B-2 stealth bomber are continuing an aerial assault on Afghanistan. And you can see the big cities that hit Herat, Kandahar, Kabul, and Jalalabad. We're going to start with some pictures of Jalalabad. There is the time in Afghanistan right now. This is the first flight we've had in Lumber Club from the Red Cobbies Creek since 1940. So we are talking about 64 years since they've had this kind of flooding. Uh, we are able now just to walk a little bit further down the street again. We can't walk too far because we do not want to get caught in the area of the Red Cobbies, which you can see if you look at that house, many over there. Many of the photographers look at the house and you see the camera running against that house. So we can't go too much further than this. But as you can look in the backyard, uh, we pointed out these cars on our way. We know we have a better vantage point of those cars. And they're in a driveway. Actually, right now, I am feeling the current as we stand here. So I think the current starts right after this house. And this is where they're not allowing people to get down to at this point because uh, because they, uh, they don't want the government to take them away and, and push them. They don't, they don't have anybody who's been hurt in this flood, anybody who's been lost in these floods. If a car thief really wants your car, it's gone. The fastest way in, just open the front door. I see a lot of people make the mistake of leaving this front door unlocked. But what if it is locked? That's not a problem. That'll only take another second. Let me fill you in on a little trade secret. You ready? Kindly. I'm in. The impeachment trial is over, and William Jefferson Clinton is still president. The Senate ended its second ever impeachment trial by finding Mr. Clinton not guilty of perjury and obstructing justice in the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Following the verdict, the president offered yet another apology to the American people. I want to say that the Thank <laughs> you. 
Constitution is fast and decisive. Well, the Torah is not acknowledging the ground, the liberty that it has been put around. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Hamid Karzai. And in his hand, what he's about to pop in his pocket is a check for $100,000 that comes along with the bank. And now Hamid Karzai takes the money. Ladies and gentlemen, God bless America, may God bless Afghanistan and the two nations. Thank you. And so, Hamid Karzai accepts the prestigious 2004 Philadelphia Liberty Bank, but so many before him, like Philips and Hendes, the Bank of Dr. Meyer, those are freedom fighters, fighting for democracy and freedom now in Afghanistan, bringing his country to America in 1776, saying, we are undertaking the same battle that we undertook, the fight for freedom. We want to go right now to Martha Lindemann, a professor from Rutgers University, who's an expert on the Middle East, to talk about the speech we just heard. And the one thing that struck me, Professor, is that you said we were going to have elections in the next few months. There was talk that we was in NATO, it was going to be September, September, September. It doesn't sound like it's going to be September anymore. Yes, it appears that there's going to be some delay. We do have a change tonight in our electoral map again. The uh, blue states are states expected to go for John Kerry, like California. The red states are states expected to go for George Bush, like most of the South. And white states, like Pennsylvania, they're battleground states. These are the states where the presidential campaign is being fought and where it will be decided. And tonight, both campaigns have added a new state to the fold. It's a huge surprise. It is the very Democratic island state of Hawaii. It's Danny according to the most recent poll. And in a race this close, those four electoral votes are very important. That's why Hawaii is going to white on almost all the electoral maps, including the ones run by the campaigns. Dick Cheney was going to pay a visit there this weekend to show you how important it is. And when the Democrats heard that he was going, they decided to send Al Gore. With that change, we can show you now where things stand right now with now the 10 battleground states. As of right now, George Bush would have 222 electoral votes for the states leaning towards him. John Kerry has 203, according to the polls. The toss-up states right now, 113. A candidate, again, needs 270 to win. 113 are available, so this is still anybody's race. And we may be waiting until Wednesday morning to find out who won the race. And you saw the ball drop earlier. What you didn't see is New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. There he is, the outgoing mayor of New York City. At midnight, he swore in the new mayor, the incoming mayor, Michael Bloomberg, as the 108th mayor of New York City. And there is Michael Bloomberg, the new mayor of New York City right now, who has to bring New York back from tragedy in 2002. Rudolph Giuliani, time man of the year. What a wonderful job he did. A lot of people questioning what will Rudolph Giuliani do next in the year 2002? The answer probably is anything he wants. And there are the men on stage in the middle of Times Square. 2001 will be remembered for one day, 9-11. Two numbers that will either be synonymous with overwhelming tragedy. It's difficult to remember anything that happened before September 11th last year, but a lot has happened since then. America has come together like never before. An international community band together with one common goal, to defeat terrorism. And there are signs that the recession is ending. So 2002 comes to us with more than just the shallow promise that things have got to get better, but with real evidence that things are going to be better than ever before. And that is something to celebrate. More of the fireworks display over Philadelphia. 2002, we are glad to see you, and to you and your family, from NBC10, a healthy and happy new year. But for a tattered flag, the disasters of September were left to a nation's subconscious. Although the disaster did have an effect, did you notice no one used the term Olympic heroes? Hero is now reserved for a select few. Some of them are standing fortress a half a world away, protecting America and the games from terror. Sometimes the greatest success is in the events that don't happen. In Southern California tonight, firefighters are battling towering walls of fire. Ten separate wildfires are raging from the Mexican border 
to the L.A. suburbs. 500,000 acres have now burned. The death toll is up to 15 people, many trying to save their homes. About 1,100 homes have gone up in smoke. Another 30,000 are in jeopardy. 100,000 people have been evacuated. This is a live picture now from the front lines. From the air, you can see the magnitude of these fires. 8,000 firefighters are on the ground right now working around the clock. I want to show you where the fires are burning. There are three main areas in the Simi Valley and around that area to the northwest of Los Angeles, San Bernardino County to the east of Los Angeles, and way down to the south in San Diego and San Diego County. This is a massive area. We said 500,000 acres burning right now at 750 square miles. Think of it this way. The area burning is the size of Philadelphia, Montgomery, and Delaware counties combined. Let's take a look at a NASA satellite photo. This is pretty impressive. It shows you the hot Santa Ana winds coming out of the desert and fueling these flames and blowing the smoke way out into the Pacific. A wider look now, you can see all of the smoke coming out into the Pacific, shooting out hundreds of miles. This is all smoke and ash. Now take a look at some incredible pictures from San Diego and San Diego County. <laughs> About 600 homes in San Diego County have been destroyed. Fires are feeding on drought-dry brush. One eyewitness said it was like staring into hell. First of all, two tornadoes confirmed. One was in Ewing, Mercer County. The other in Flemington, Hunterton County, both in New Jersey. Was this, come on down here, was this a tornado that hit in Narberth? Some people here think it is. Doesn't really matter at this point because it caused a lot of damage. They're trying to get power back up on Wynwood Avenue here at the end of Windsor. They are crews that came in from Illinois to help out with the Hurricane Isabel. They're staying here to help here. Take a look at this house. A tree fell right in the front, causing damage. The people couldn't get out of their front door. As a matter of Johanna, come on over here for a second. This is uh, Johanna Hertz, who lives in this house. What did you hear this morning? Well, I heard a loud groaning sound a couple times, and the lights flickered, and then I went upstairs, and I heard what I assumed was a tree falling down. And you said you heard, what was that? Uh, it was like a loud groan. You know, people always describe it as a train, hearing a loud train, and it certainly sounds similar to that. We should point out that that's a brand new car over here that the tree fell on. Thank you, Johanna. Historic day for perhaps the most important historic symbol in the nation. We're talking, of course, about the Liberty Bell, which is right across the street. As a matter of fact, let's walk across the street right now and show you what's going on over there right now. Tomorrow, by the way, the Liberty Bell will be moved to a new home on Philadelphia's Independence Mall, which is right outside of our studios. As a matter of fact, tonight, that bell already started the trip. Tonight, the fragile 2,000-pound bell was lifted 8 inches by a hydraulic crane placed on a special cart. The biggest problem in moving the 250-year-old symbol of freedom is to keep it from being damaged. Its large crack is famous, of course, and no one wants that to get any bigger. But there's also a hairline crack above the big one. At about 8.30 tonight, the bell was moved by hand 25 feet, then locked down for the night. The last time it was moved was in 1976, when it was taken from Independence Mall to the pavilion on Market Street. All right, right now we're outside of the Channel 3 studios. I'm on uh, 5th Street. I'm going to walk across 5th Street. I want to tell you why this is significant. Take a look from Chopper 3. You can see the uh, distance I'm walking. It measures out from that studio to exactly 300 feet. Now, when the Liberty Bell moves tomorrow from its old home to its new home, it's going to go 300 feet. It's taking me, what, about a minute and a half to walk over here? It's going to take the bell about four and a half hours to make that same move. But actually, because it's going in like a zigzag because of a ceremony, it moves 963 feet or three and a half feet a minute. They're being very, very careful. I'm going to bring in Stephen Arms from Microstream Corporation. Uh, your people all night have been putting sensors on the Liberty Bell to make certain that it doesn't have too much stress. What happens... If it does have too much stress, what are you going to do tomorrow? Well, what we're going to do is we're pretty confident that everything's going to work just fine. Okay. I'm sure they're a little bit relaxed because you're on the case. Stephen Arms from MicroStrain in Vermont, thank you very much. We just showed you the video of them hooking up those sensors tonight. And I'm Larry Menti, live outside of Broadcast Plaza in the middle of this windstorm. What? We almost just lost our monitor there, as a matter of fact. Why don't you let go of it? I'll let this go down for one second. All right. 
photographer doing a great job. He's shooting me and holding up the monitor. Things blowing all over Center City, Philadelphia. The wind has been whipping through the streets here, sometimes gusting to up over 50 miles per hour. We just got word in a moment ago that there's a power outage now. Power lines are down in the Kensington section of the city at Front and Lehigh. We don't know how many people are affected. We'll check on that and get right back to you. If you are just joining us and just seeing these pictures, it is quite a shock. This is what's being called the worst collapse in Atlantic City history. It is a construction project, mostly a parking garage, but a shopping facility as well. It is attached to the Tropicana Hotel. It collapsed at about 1040 today. Here are the numbers, and they are devastating. 18 people at area hospitals being treated, several people being treated at the scene. 12 people still missing, possibly in that rubble. There are search crews right now looking for them. And at this point, the Associated Press has confirmed that one person has died. There are many, many questions as to why this has happened. But right now, the safety and the well-being of the construction workers, both being treated at the hospital and possibly trapped inside that building, are of the utmost importance. And that is all anyone is really thinking about right now. There is a call going out for all search and rescue crews in southern New Jersey to report to this scene. You are watching CBS 3's live coverage of the installation ceremonies of Archbishop Justin Regali at the Cathedral Basilica of Saints Peter and Paul in Philadelphia. Right now, you are looking at live pictures of the procession. And there is Anthony Cardinal de Villacqua. Archbishop Justin Francis Regali is succeeding Anthony Cardinal Bevilacqua, who is retiring now after 15 years. This is a procession of 1,000 priests, deacons, bishops, cardinals, and one very important archbishop. Archbishop Regali becomes the new spiritual leader of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Larry Menti on this historic day for the nearly one and a half million Roman Catholics of the Philadelphia Archdiocese. As we watch the ceremony together, there will be some special vestments, special symbols that I want to point out to you ahead of time. These are items that mark important moments in the ceremony itself, items you will see at regular Sunday Mass. This, uh, by the way, is a mitre. This is the headdress that is worn by bishops, including Archbishop Regali. Now, he gets to choose his own mitre and the symbols you see here. This is the simplest of the mitres that one can choose. This is a humble mitre for a humble man. You can also see during the ceremony his pectoral cross worn on a chain by bishops as a mark of the office. Now, sometimes the bishops will wear just the chain and tuck the cross itself into their pocket because the cross is heavy. So most bishops will keep it in their pocket. You may also see a coat of arms today. Now, this is designed that is designed by the Archbishop himself. The green at the top, this symbolizes that he is an Archbishop. He may choose to change it to red when he becomes a Cardinal. That's his choice, most do. On the left side of the shield is the symbol of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. This includes the coat of arms of William Penn himself. Now, on the right side, that is the personal arms of Archbishop Regali. He chose a simple one, the Cairo, the symbol for Christ. Again, a very humble coat of arms chosen by the Archbishop. Underneath, right here in Latin, is his personal motto. The word was made flesh. During the ceremony, Archbishop Regali will also be led to the cathedra. The word is Greek for chair, and it symbolizes the Archbishop's authority. This chair will be a big part of today's ceremony. When he sits in this chair, he is officially the Archbishop of Philadelphia. He's being led right now to the cathedra. When he sits down, he will officially be the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. He's being handed the crozier right now to signify that he is now going to lead the 1.5 million Catholics in Philadelphia as part of his flock, and that is getting a standing ovation. Yeah, the significance of right, right now is being uh, experienced by all that is present, and fortunately for our viewers. Chuck Lewis, moral theologian, we could not have done it without you today. Thank you so very much for your expert analysis. Pat Chiraki will have a full report also at 4 o'clock. I'd like to thank her for her reports outside. We now have a new archbishop for the Catholic Church in Philadelphia and a new spiritual leader for the city. And with men and women still overseas, the threat of terrorism, violence in the streets, violence in the homes, we can use every spiritual leader we can get. So Archbishop Justin Regali, or as they call him today, Archbishop Justin, we need you now more than ever. Welcome to Philadelphia. Whenever there is a big event in this city, Philadelphians do what Philadelphians do best. We worry. 
Sandwiched in between New York and Washington, two cities who get all of the media attention all of the time, Philadelphia has kind of a middle child syndrome. It is the metropolitan version of Jan Brady. We want the attention, but we're always worried something is going to go wrong. Visions of the 64 Phillies flash through our heads every time we do get the national attention. But the city contracts are signed. The protesters so far are peaceful, and the city looks better, as Michael just said, than it ever has. So don't worry. After all, we do political gatherings pretty well. Remember that one back in 1776? Everybody is still talking about that one.